we stand forever at a point in time called now. The past, we can only remember. At best, we can learn from it. The future, we can only surmise. At best, we can try to shape it. Less than five hours from this point of now, John A. Mankey will find himself suspended eight miles above the Mojave Desert. As test pilot for NASA's Flight Research Center, he will play out his role in shaping the future in a wingless craft that looks as though it has no right to fly. Three hours now. John Mankey has already flown an F-104 over the test range to check for turbulence and return satisfied. In the nearby physiological van, a medical team is affixing tiny sensing devices to his body to transmit his physiological reactions during the flight to recorders at ground control. Since weeks before now, Engineers and technicians have been checking and rechecking every fitting and instrument and connector in this lifting body called the HL-10. Finally, to fill its tanks with the alcohol and liquid oxygen that will, in little more than two hours, propel it for the first time faster than the speed of sound. Getting men into space is one problem. Getting them back is another one. They ride out on thundering names like Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. Batter their way back through the searing atmosphere at more than 17,000 miles per hour. And once through that barrier, ride parachutes to an ocean splashdown. For infrequent missions, a widespread recovery force of dozens of ships spread over hundreds of miles can be justified. But as more and more men are suited up to leave their world, as flights to and from orbiting space stations become more frequent, then easier, more flexible, less costly ways to let them return simply must be found. That's what John Mankey and the HL-10 and NASA and the Air Force are doing making sure answers will be ready by the time they're needed. Less than 90 minutes from now, the flat-bodied craft will be carried eight miles high beneath the wing of this B-52, there to be released as another step in the proof of a theory conceived almost 20 years ago at NASA's Ames Research Center. Up to the present, manned spacecraft have been cone-shaped, re-entering blunt end first, but they lack maneuverability. At first, it might seem reasonable to turn the vehicle around and re-enter with the pointed end forward. However, this shape would generate excessive heat, and more important, it still would not have the desired maneuverability. The first modification was to make its cone slender and blunt its nose, but it still could not fly well or be maneuvered. So the next modification was to slice the cone lengthwise. In effect, this reduces the pressure on the top so that pressure on the bottom will dominate, providing more aerodynamic lift and greatly reducing drag. In theory, it should fly, but could it be maneuvered and landed? Ideally, a way was needed to bring down the half cone, much like a conventional airplane. For such a landing, the best shape is shallow and broad. By flattening and widening the half cone, and adding aerodynamic surfaces for control, a configuration was evolved. A lifting body, capable both of high-speed re-entry and low-speed landing. Such a craft could act as a shuttle, carrying people and material from space stations back to Earth. From outer space, its pilot could maneuver it to touch down at a pre-selected landing site. Or, if necessary, alter his course and land at a different location. Unlike the now familiar space capsule, the lifting body is reusable. Its initial cost could be spread over hundreds of flights. And the configuration lends itself to larger sizes, able to carry dozens, perhaps scores of passengers. 
but a child must crawl before he walks and walk before he runs. In the lifting body program, crawling for John Mankey means countless hours in this simulator, up to 50 hours for each flight, while an analog computer interprets his every move and patiently plots out the reaction it would produce if he were airborne. And it means many dead stick landings in an F-104, trimmed to approximate the lifting body's characteristics. Seven years earlier, the first full-scale flight test model crawled, literally, as an automobile towed it aloft at the end of a cable. Simple in construction and low in cost, it nevertheless did what the wind tunnel tests had said it would. It flew. Now it was time to walk. The DC-3 towed the lightweight steel and plywood lifting body and its pilot to altitudes up to 12,000 feet. There it was released and allowed to glide in free flight to the desert floor to land at a speed of 80 miles per hour. first test vehicle logged over 400 successful flights. But all that is the past for John Mankey. As with fellow test pilot Bill Dana, who will control this flight, he walks toward his future, less than 90 minutes from now, poised beneath the protective wing of the B-52. Mankey is a professional, long familiar with flight test procedures. That procedure is to increase the performance step by step until the craft has been pushed to its limits in terms of altitude and speed. Lifting bodies have flown before, of course, and many times. The first heavyweight configuration was called the M2F2. On a hot July day in 1966, another NASA test pilot, Milt Thompson, made the first glide flight. Even though developed from the earlier configuration, this was no plywood lightweight but a fully equipped test vehicle weighing almost three tons and designed to touch down at over 200 miles per hour. The eight mile drop took less than four minutes. One successful flight proved only that it could be done. Refinement, improvement, the evolution of an idea into a working system would have to come from many such flights. From hypersonic wind tunnel evaluation. And from constructing and testing a number of different designs. This lifting body, the HL-10, with three vertical stabilizers instead of two, was developed at Langley Research Center. Less than six months after the initial M2F2 flight, the HL-10 took its first plunge to the desert, with NASA's Bruce Peterson at the control. Then, shortly after launch, trouble. Problems with the controls. Next, a strange high-speed buffeting the wind tunnel tests had failed to disclose. Peterson could have ejected, but he still had control of his craft and chose to ride it out as the ground reached up for him at more than 200 miles per hour.
Chris would call a piece of cake. He always does after someone has done it, and the moment has been frozen on film. And John Mankey, now less than an hour from takeoff, put from his mind another moment, a long moment that began a year before when Bruce Peterson again dropped away from the mothership in the M2F2. A moment that continued as violent oscillations suddenly struck the craft near the ground. pilot managed to recover, but too much precious time and altitude had been lost. The moment ended. Miraculously, the man survived. So did the airframe, to be rebuilt for future flights. But for John Mankey, this is now. Sealed in his own tiny world, he has too much ahead of him to reflect on the past. He knows the control problems have long been corrected. And in 45 minutes, and what will be only its fourth rocket-powered flight, he will push the HL-10 through the sound barrier of Mach 1, up to 724 miles per hour. The lifting body has proved over and over that it can maneuver and land. But wind tunnel tests have never shown exactly what will happen as it exceeds the speed of sound. Only when its rocket engines kick it through that critical barrier will they and John Mankey be sure. labeled a success, though of course he can't know that yet. To the scientists whose speculation made it conceivable, to the engineers and technicians who made it possible, to John Mankey, whose life depends on all of them and his own skill besides, this is the successful completion of another milestone. But in a broader sense, it is just a test, another step in the evolution of an idea. Future flights will go higher, up to the fringe of the atmosphere and return at speeds well above the speed of sound. In the now that will be with us tomorrow, a lifting body may return men and women from space, much as commercial jets land today. Or from this work, some new, as yet unthought of, configuration may emerge. For the moment always with us called now, always changes.